Hello, welcome to everyone who's joining us. Today, in honor of National Women's Day, we're going to do something a little bit different. I usually ask you to drop a line about um, where you're joining us from. Today, I'm inviting you to include the name of a person, a woman who inspires you in our chat. And if you're willing to let me share that, then I think this could be a fun way to, to use our time before the webinar officially starts. Kyle says he's joining us from Aurora. Kyle, do you have a woman you would, who inspires you? Oh, yeah. Alita says Deb Holland. Chris says Kathleen. I'm going to mess this up. Stashowski. Thank you guys for sharing. I don't know if many of you know this, but some people call Mesa Verde National Park the women's park because it was actually um, some advocacy on the part of two very special women who helped to make it a national park. Ah, Monica. <laughs> Monica says she's <laughs> inspired by Dr. Travis and I. Ah, and Dr. Travis says Lynn Marie Mitchell. And Mike in Greeley says his fourth grade teacher. So for all those teachers out there, you should really feel very special because you're still making a difference, even when we're adults. Kyle also says Mary Russell Farrell Colton. I hope I said all of that correctly. Please excuse me if my pronunciations are, um, you know, a little off. We appreciate you all being here and we appreciate you sharing. Uh, so Doc, or Steve Parker says that Eugenia Miller is his spouse and she inspires him. And, oh, Tara, not our Tara, <laughs> but Tara Barish, Barish is the curator and collections manager at the Moab, Moab Museum. And she says she's inspired by the poet Joy Harjo, Harho, Harjo. Okay. <laughs> oh, and Teresa says she's inspired by Jane Goodall, Mother Teresa, Mary Coulter, Oprah Winfrey, and Georgia O'Keeffe. Teresa, those are all great ones. And I recognized every one of those names. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate your willingness to share. We are just about to get started and, and in continuation of our National Women's Day celebration, I want to say that I am inspired by the two ladies who are here with me today because they are both making and preserving history. Um, and I'm going to let Monica take it away from here. Monica, you're on mute. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you, everyone, for leaving women you're inspired by in the chat box. It's a wonderful day to have three women here, and especially Dr. Tara Travis for everything she's doing, continuing the line um, of preservation and conservation at the park. I'm on the board of the Mesa Verde Foundation, and I'll be moderating today's event. We are most privileged to welcome back Dr. Tara Travis. Tara is the Supervisory Museum Curator at Mesa Verde National Park and Yucca House National Monument. You might remember Tara's informative webinar last year in which we had an insider's look into the Mary Coulter jewelry donation. Today, Tara will take us on a virtual behind the scenes tour of the Mesa Verde National Park archives. Few outside the National Park Service are aware that the park archives retained, regardless of format, include paper, photograph, floppy disk, email, tape recording, and videos considered museum property and fall under the Museum Guidance for Preservation 
and public access. We will explore why records are retained and as well as gain insight into little known treasures and their significance to the park. The Mesa Verde Foundation is the official philanthropic nonprofit partner to Mesa Verde National Park. As a foundation, we secure funding for the park's capital improvements, special projects, and further promote understanding and preservation for ancestral Puebloan culture. On the topic of special projects, I would like to make mention of the park's museum's digital imaging fundraising initiative. The museum collection has thousands of museum artifacts that could be photographed for greater accessibility by the American public. Tara and the park's visual information specialists have been working together to build a digital image library of the museum collection. Mesa Verde invested in new equipment, created a workspace near windows where visitors can watch the objects being photographed and wrote an operational practice manual for metadata standards. The funds will be used to continue to upgrade the park capabilities in this area and further build the digital library. If you'd like to contribute to this monumental project, please see the donation link in the chat box. I would like to thank the park superintendent, Casey Cook Collins for her support and our amazing board of directors. Our programming is possible solely from the donations and the support of Mesa Verde Foundation fellows and members like you. We thank you for creating space for this webinar offering. Now, circling back to our guest speaker, Tara is a public historian whose work has focused on the Four Corners region, working with tribal communities, managing museum collections, designing and installing exhibits, promoting historic preservation, and documenting cultural landscapes. In her current position at Mesa Verde, she has directed the move of the museum collection and the installation of exhibits at the new Visitor and Research Center, and shepherded the gift of the estate of David Rockefeller from the collection of David and Peggy Rockefeller. Prior to this position, Tara served for 10 years as an ethno-historian in the National Park Service. Tara started her career at the Museum of Northern Arizona and joined um, SARS School of Advanced Research in Santa Fe. I would like to now welcome Tara to the webinar. <laughs> Tara, <laughs> it's so good to see you. It's so good to see you, Monica, and you inspire me as does Shannon, and I appreciate so much this opportunity to share uh, an area that sometimes gets overlooked because of all of our magnificent three-dimensional objects, but I think it's time to talk about this other tremendous resource that the park has, and I'm super excited to talk about it. Uh, so, yeah, I'm ready to begin. All right, wonderful. And I'm just gonna ask viewers if you wouldn't mind saving your questions till the end, we'll try and get through them all. And so Tara, please take it away. All right, I'm going to share my screen and start my PowerPoint. So let me... And we're going to Oops. Let me see if I can move this down a bit so that I can see how to start the There it is. Yay. Okay. <laughs> So welcome to the Mesa Verde National Park Archives. And you have before you is, does it look good? Is everything good? It looks beautiful. Okay. You have in front of you a beautiful photo of Cliff Palace. And next to it is a, a drawing of one of the walls of one of the rooms in Cliff Palace by Larry Nordby. And he has color coded the stabilization and documentation history of that particular wall. And that's that's a resource that's available in our archive. And it shows you how important the archival resources are for understanding the actual resources that Mesa Verde protects, preserves, and shares with all of you. 
So I think I will go start with what's an archive. And this is a word that oftentimes gets interchanged with other words, such as museum collections. Sometimes uh, folks confuse a curator with an archivist. And so I think it's good to start with the basics. And no better place to find those definitions for what is an archive than with the Society of American Archivists. And this is from their website. So archives refers to permanent records, such as letters, reports, maps, drawings. Uh, three, you know, it can include digital data, born digital data, uh, floppy disks, you know, CDs, and they are the documents, the records of people, businesses, and government. Uh, they are key to understanding the agency and they document evidence from the past. Uh, they, they contain facts that we use to understand and interpret history. And in the case of the National Park Service, the archives are often used to aid park managers and helping them to make science-based decisions about the resource. We also know that archives contain silences, a lack of acknowledgement for previous communities or groups of individuals. And so they are an incomplete record, but they certainly support our understanding of the past. Archives can also represent an, a word for an organization. Uh, we have the National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA, which is the archive of the United States government. Or we have the Mesa Verde Archive, which refers to the archival records for Mesa Verde National Park. But we also use the word archives to describe a building. This is where you might say this is the park archive and you're pointing to a physical space, a room or a building where we house archival records. So it has three different meanings and you'll hear me use the archive term in these three different ways in this talk. So it's, uh, it's kind of a catch-all term, but it covers some complex concepts and is really integral to how we do business in the National Park Service. And it starts out not as an archive, right? How do things end up in an archive? Well, they begin as a record. So they begin as something that documents an activity, whether it's an invitation to lunch, a memo from the superintendent stating we're moving from our winter uniforms to our summer uniforms, or it may be very detailed architectural drawings as we saw on the first slide that help to document an architectural feature in one of our maintained sites at Mesa Verde. So a record is also generally active, right? It's something that you're using day to day as part of your project or as part of your work. But when something becomes inactive and something documents an activity of the government that supports how we are managing our resources, and in the case of Mesa Verde National Park, our first national park dedicated to the preservation of cultural resources, those types of records, those cultural resource records, natural resource records, and management records belong in the archive because they document the government's activities. And if you're gathering data on a consistent basis, such as you're documenting wildlife sightings, those types of records often are sent to the archive in predictable cycles. So the archive is where records are preserved and made accessible for researchers. And as Monica noted in her introduction, a record is format neutral, meaning it can be paper, photographs, floppy disks, emails. It can even be born digital data. And more and more, that's what we're going to be preserving in our archive. By born digital, I mean it's, a, it's an Excel table. It was created on a computer. It was saved on that computer. It's never been in print, but it's a very important Excel table if it's in the archive and it documents uh, some important activity. And so what you see in front of you 
is our flow chart, our decision-making tree that we use in the Park Service on how to determine what is a record. And so if you look at this flower, the Records and Electronic Information Management Guide, which is what we use to uh, organize our records of the National Park Service, you can see that the center of the flower is resource management and land records. Why would that be the center? What's so important about those records that they, they're kind of the hub around which all the other activities take place? Well, it goes back to our organic act, right? We are here to preserve in perpetuity these lands and resources for the enjoyment of the American public into the future. And so records that document how we are preserving and protecting and making available those lands, those resources is central to every park's mission. And so it is, it's where our management and accountability most often reside in the resource management and lands record group. So we are required to manage our records and um, we, are, we follow laws and regulations to do this. And um, in terms of their value in resource management, it's a requirement for managing resources forever. It sets a high standard for record keeping because resources can't be managed well in the future if we don't have documentation or complete records of how they were managed in the past. And boy, does this come into play every day in the resource management activities at Mesa Verde National Park. Our archeologists have a vast amount of information at their fingertips about how Nussbaum recorded his work at Step House or how um, early preservation activities modify the original fabric of a given maintained site in order to make it safe for visitors. We also know that preserving our records and following guidance helps us to be efficient in the use of our staff and our funding we need to be efficient in responding to requests for information and following um, this format helps us to do that. It allows us to be if responsiveness, you know, if our information is complete and we've maintained it and, it and important records are in the archive, then we can respond to those requests and accountability. That's a big part of what the government does. We need to document our important actions and decisions, and these must be available to the public, particularly in the event of legal actions. So one of the ways to think about this is when we're trying to figure out if something is a record, we ask ourselves, does it document NPS policies, activities, transactions, or resources? And so here is a typical document that I use to help Mesa Verde staff turn over project records to the archive. And I ask them to think about some questions when they're trying to make a decision if it's time for something to go to the park archive. So I ask them to ask these questions. When is a project closed? Is there a final report? How often are you accessing this information now? Is it a monitoring activity or something that's recurring? And that should be turned over on a regularly scheduled basis. And then, okay, if you make that decision that it needs to go to the archive, you need to determine what's permanent versus temporary records. So oftentimes employees will go through and pull out those documents that we discussed earlier that aren't per pertinent to the fundamental purposes of the park and the management of resources. Once again, we're not gonna keep that memo about a uniform or that email about, you know, do you, need, do you want to go to lunch or should the meeting be at 10 or at 12? And then we have the employee complete a records transmittal form that answers 
the who, what, where, when, and how of, of this project. And so there's a uh, room for a description. We have the dates that the project was going on, who, what was the official title of the project, uh, what's the name and address of the, of the lead, who was involved in the project. And you'll notice there's a space down at the bottom where I can assign, where I can assign an accession number. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So I'm gonna take a step back, bear with me, and I'll tell you a little bit of my archive story. So my first job with the National Park Service was curator at Canyon de Chez National Monument. And I was, I spent part of my year out in the field as the field curator as part of an archaeological survey of Canyon del Muerto. But I was also the curator and responsible for the day-to-day decision-making of the, of the on-site museum collection and the library and archive, although we didn't call it an archive. And so one day I got a call from two archivists who worked for the National Park Service, Lynn Marie Mitchell, who I mentioned in the chat, and Khalil Saba. And they are archivists with the Intermountain Region of the National Park Service at a place called the Western Archaeological and Conservation Center in Tucson. And they had received funding for an archives integration project. And I didn't know what that meant. And they said they wanted to come out and, and work in the park for a week and a half. And I said, sure, great. So they arrived. And they explained to me that there had become a bit of an intellectual separation from the museum collection and the artifacts and the three-dimensional objects and cultural items uh, that were part of the Canyon de Chez museum collection. And the records that the archeologists produced when they were collecting these objects so we had a really big project that Don Morris was the archeologist and he conducted excavations at Antelope House. And we had all of this documentation of Don Morris's project at Antelope House. And we had many museum objects from that excavation, but they were separate because they had not been, the records had not been assigned an accession number. And once we assigned an accession number, which was the same number we used for the objects, we were marrying those two separate records, you know, the objects and the archives together, and thus an archives integration. And so the reason they had come to Canyon de Chez and the reason they had selected our little park as their first effort foray into this project was that they knew we had an ongoing archaeological project. We knew that the project archaeologist had, had done a vast amount of research in with all those archaeological records leading up to the project. So he had done a vast amount of research and he had a great deal of knowledge. And so he was, it was a very pretty straightforward process to assign the accession number uh, of the record group with the objects. So anyway, it was a great week. I learned so much and they joked and they teased me that I was a recovering historian. And I didn't know what that meant at the time, but as time has gone on, I've appreciated it more and more. And that's because the archivists, they're there to, oh, and I think I've got it from the Society of American Archivists website. So these two professions have a longstanding partnership. The archivist identifies, preserves, and make, makes records accessible for use. The historian uses archival records for research. So anyway, we had a, you know, a really wonderful, I had a wonderful experience, and I learned so much from Lynn and Khalil. And then I went on to the Southern Arizona office, and I pursued a PhD in history, and as part of my public history component. I took a course in archival management and I helped with uh, to lead an oral history work group and those types of activities. And um, 
After completing my PhD, I worked for the Office of Indian Affairs, and then I came to Mesa Verde. So here I am at Mesa Verde. I know that's a long story, but it'll help. So here I am at Mesa Verde, and at that time, the brand new visitor and research center was a dream still. And I was working out of the, and you'll look at that sign, you can see the, over there on the left-hand side, it says research center. I was working in what the staff called the research center or archeology span lab, or more lovingly, the tin shed. It's a very large building, but it was sheathed in tin in order to create some kind of barrier between the museum collection and potential wildfire activity. So one solution to trying, trying to safeguard the museum collection was to sheathe this entire building in tin. And the image to your right is looking back at uh, over to your left, there's some map cases. Over to your right, there's some fireproof file cabinets. And you can also see into a room, and that was the designated archive room up at uh, in the CCC loop, 19 miles into the park. This is where we housed our museum collection and archive. And so um, the my predecessors had done a fab fantastic job of preserving the, the archival collection. They had, as you can see here, most things are in archival boxes. For further protection, they, they had also used fireproof files, which would provide some additional protection, some environmental control. You know, when you've, when you've got that metal barrier, of a fireproof file cabinet, you're preserving them a little bit better, maintaining a more stable environment. You're trying to pre prevent or protect against fire, and they were in a room for security purposes. So they were doing the very best they could to meet National Park Service standards. But the organization of the archive was based more or less on location. So you can see these white labels on these fireproof file cabinets, and this was the descriptor of what was contained in that file. And you might be able, you probably can't, but each of those fireproof file cabinets has a number sprayed on it that says RC1, RC2, that stands for Research Center 1, Research Center 2. And they, you know, employees had at their desk the location of archives that they used to do their work. So when I saw this, I had an aha moment. I knew that this park could benefit from that archives integration philosophy. And I knew that there was work that we could do and it seemed just very daunting, you know? And so we went around and you can see the pink sticky labels. And every time you see a pink sticky label, that has an accession number to it. And that tied those physical records to our three-dimensional museum collection. So we moved the archives down to the new visitor and research center in 2012. And we have a dedicated archive it's called the Mesa Verde National Park Archive, and this is the doorway that leads into that space. It says Archive, Library, and Research, Room 114. And actually, those doors open into several rooms, a processing room, a research space, three offices, um, a media space that has a copier and some scanners, and then we have an archive, an archive room, and I'll show you a picture of that next. Oops, no, I won't. So I will go forward just to show you, this is the archive space at the Visitor and Research Center. So moving back, I called Lynn and Khalil, my secret power, and I said, hey, we, we could use some of the, the skill sets that uh, I, I benefited from at Canyon to Shake. Can you guys come and take a look at the Mesa Verde archive and help me figure out how we can better intellectually associate these records? And so they came down and they, 
they took a really hard look at all, by a hard look, they looked in every box. They verified the veracity of the accession numbers we had assigned to all of these archival boxes. And they, they began the process of thinking bigger about the amount of records that we had and began to think about, is there a hierarchy that we can use above and beyond the accession number to help organize and retrieve records into the future? So we came up with, well, we didn't come up with it. We took a step back from all of those accession numbers and all of the records and saw underneath the surface, the existing hierarchy of the Mesa Verde archives. And we created 22 record groups, which you see here. And they should be so obvious, right? I mean, the historic records and central files are our administrative or management records. Uh, we have two different series because the Park Service had a Dewey decimal system type filing system up until the 1950s. And then we switched to an alpha system from 1950s to the 20, 2012. So we have our historic records. But what else do you think of when you think of Mesa Verde? Think back on that tin shed. We have a lot of fire records. And these are really important records. We were one of the first parks in the National Park Service to implement using archaeologists to go out with firefighters to go ahead of firefighters and identify archeological resources that could be damaged or need additional protection when fighting wildland fire. Well, all of this amazing work in wildland fire management and archeological work is recorded in our fire records. Then we have our natural resource record group, our cultural resource record group, which is the big one, right? I mean, we're here, we're a national park for our cultural resources. We have the Civilian Conservation Corps. We have the UC Boulder Field School records and the Wetherill Mesa Archaeological Project. Oh my goodness, it was the largest archaeological project of its day. And a very large portion of our museum collection is from the Wetherill Mesa Project. And then we have our visitor and research center records. So these are the architectural drawings and the exhibit uh, documents for the new visitor and research center. We have Niagara and tribal consultation records, and we have facilities and interpretation record groups, donated and historic photograph collections. And then two very significant archaeologists who worked in the park, Jesse L. Nussbaum, his papers and photographic collection. And we have Jesse Walter Fuchs record collection. So these are the big buckets, buckets that we created out of the initial archives integration work that we did. So what I'm saying to you is that under the natural resource records, we may have several accessions, right? Because we had several different projects, uh, many, many natural resource projects that were completed in the past. But overall, we have a natural resource record group. So this hierarchy was created and discussed among park staff and park leadership, and everyone agreed that this this was a good way moving forward. So every single box had a pink sticky on it and we organized the archive according to the hierarchy that we created, according to the record groups. And if you look over on the right, you can see our special collection cabinets where we keep our, our books and uh, books donated by Mary Coulter. And right now that compact mobile storage unit is opened up to our natural resource records, which you can see have been processed. By processing, they've been processed, arranged, cataloged, rehoused, and a finding aid has been created. And there's also um, the cataloging has been entered into our 
Museum database, which is called ICMS or the Interior Collections Management System. I always trip over that, but anyway. So here, once again, is the MEV archives record groups. So the ones in yellow have been processed. So none of the records had been processed at the hierarchy level. We had had archivists work very diligently in the past in the park, and they had created 22 discrete collections. But that an analogy might be that's making that's chipping ice off an iceberg. There, it's it was there was just a huge amount of backlog archives that needed to be processed, appraised, cataloged, um, and rehoused. And so we scrapped together funds over the years, uh, benefited from National Park Service or in you know park funds. So the the groups, the archive record groups that are highlighted in yellow, those have been processed. So our historic records and central files, the fire records, the natural resource records, the Civilian Conservation Corps and the UC Boulder Field School, and the news bomb papers and photographs. The Weatherall Mesa Archaeological Project records are green because they're partially processed. So what, what's the benefit to the American public by having archives processed? Well, when archives aren't processed, they can't be made available to the American public. And the reason for that is unprocessed archives can contain personally, un personally identifiable information, what we all call PII. So we don't want to inadvertently share with someone information that is private. We also might have HIPAA information or um, other types of information uh, restricted information that might, for example, the location of sensitive archaeological resources. And so, although we've been able to access unprocessed records to do the vital work of the government, they're very limited. We're, they're just, we're not able to really share them in a way that we want to with all the other partners and, and the American public. So it's important that we, we process and get these records out there. So once records are processed, they are rehoused and that's an added benefit. We're preserving them for future generations. We're preserving them in perpetuity. So the completed storage upgrades that are part of a processing project would include archival containers, folders, boxes, protective enclosures. Uh, there's different formats and different types of ways that we preserve different records that come into the, into the archive. And as you know, at the New Visitor and Research Center, we have very tight controls on humidity and temperature. We have security and we have fire protection. So one of the benefits of processing and cataloging our museum archives is that we can create finding aids and container lists. So I brought with me the Natural Resource Record Group Finding Aid, and I opened up to page 143. And on that page, there's a description of what you can find in two folders in series 008. It's the Mancus Canyon Environmental Assessment and Restoration Project from 1998 to 99. This file unit contains two folders regarding the Mancus Canyon Environment and Assessment and Restoration Project. So a finding aid can be made available online to the American public and they can see a description of what's in every file folder in that archival record group. And so for natural resources, you can go to the Mesa Verde, well, right now you go to me and I'll provide you with a finding aid, but in the future we're going to make these finding aids available online. And that's one of the products that comes out of processing an archive. We also have lists of all the donated books from Mary Coulter. That was 
uh, process special collection. And we have, um, well, I'll keep going on to the next slide, but finding aids are a descriptive document that aids researchers in finding what they need about any given topic. So for historians conducting research, finding aids are very helpful because it helps us to narrow down the records that we want to examine to help us understand a historical question that we have as part of our research. So the most important thing that comes out of this effort is that we are once our archive is an archival record group is processed is we can answer research requests and make those resources available to the public. And that's a big part of our responsibility as part of archivist ethics to make archival resources available. And, um, you know, in that previous environment, they were not accessible. But now down at the Visitor and Research Center, uh, about a third of our archive has been processed and is available for use. And it also makes scanning. So scanning is a big issue. Scanning is something everybody wants to have our records scanned. And once records are processed, then you can scan them in a way that's very efficient and cost effective. And you can apply metadata that helps you find things in those scanned archives. And somewhere in here, well, we created an SOP for attaching metadata. And that means that every scan has with it the associated information, such as the accession number and the record group and who created the document and, and uh, what are the years that, what year was this document created? So it provides that digital tie back to the physical archival record. So as we're into the final part of my talk, I'm super excited to talk about the cultural resource management records. So when we started this whole archive project, the you know 800 pound gorilla in the room was our cultural resource management records. Of all the records we have in our archive, the greatest number of records come from our cultural resource record group, right? That makes sense. We're the first national park established for our cultural resources. For the at the time of our enabling legislation, they said the works of man, but in honor of today and uh, Women's Day, uh, on International Women's Day, let's just say the works of humankind. So we're here to, to preserve the ancestral Puebloan architecture and landscapes that represent the Mesa Verde region. So our cultural resource management records are really the key to understanding our park's resources. And here is the hierarchy of the cultural resource management record group. So series one is administrative. This is where we keep our national historic landmark records, national register. Our series two is compliance, section 106 in NEPA. So this, this documents how we made decisions. Do we make good management decisions, science-based decisions in terms of following the National Environmental Protection Act? We have, uh, projects that are under that series two. Series three is all of our archeological records, the prehistoric and historic archeological site files. We have the ACP, the architectural documentation projects. We have our, our the records of the preservation and conservation of architecture, our plaster records, we have photographic records, right, from all of these various projects. We have rock art documentation. And so all of that is under series three. And then we have ethnographic resources. Series five is historic structures. Series six is cultural landscapes. And series seven is oral history. And underneath this cultural resource management record group, we have many accessions, such as the oral history record group. I just gave that accession number 
as an example. So that was, uh, so the reason I kind of have a blank slide is that um, we're at the point where I get to make uh, the first public announcement of uh, a major event that has just recently transpired since we had this large record group that was unprocessed, we were very concerned about how we were going to make these records available to the American public and maximize their use for research and education and uh, public enjoyment. And so year after year, I submitted a project proposal to the cultural resources funds of the National Park Service. And this is a competitive um, project proposal. It's a funding source which parks submit project proposals and they are evaluated by a National Park Service team of, of individuals from throughout the Park Service and they rate and rank according to specific criteria. And so from a few years, I've submitted a project to process, appraise, catalog, and make and rehouse the cultural resource record group. And I'm happy to announce that we did receive funding for, or we will be, I should say, we will be receiving funding in fiscal year 2024 to complete that work. So it's very exciting. I'm, I'm just over the moon because this is the largest record group in the archive. And uh, these records are just so important. So I'm super excited to be announcing that. And I uh, brought along a couple of uh, things to show you while I take uh, questions. And um, thank you so much for listening to my archive story. And I'm happy that I was able to share this journey with you. Well, thank you so much, Tara. I have to say you're the most exciting curator discussing archives, <laughs> records, storage, funding grants. <laughs> it's wonderful. So thank you for your enthusiasm. Um, <laughs> really and truly, because from I know what goes into all of this and repository collections, how tedious it is. And so many people make the assumption that your curator, so this goes beyond what's displayed at the museum and at the visitor center. You know, we just see, or the general public sees just the exhibitions and the work that mm -hmm. you did putting, um, coordinating the, the display cases, but there's this whole mechanics behind the museum. So thank you for that. Um, we have so many questions, so I might as well get into some of them. We have a few from Teresa. One of them is, when will the museum be open to the public again? Uh, when will the museum, Chapin Mesa Museum, be open to the public again? So we are currently installing uh, ramps to allow for better accessibility into the museum spaces. And once that work is complete, we'll be opening up the museum. We'll be... It, you'll be surprised because we'll be having some temporary exhibits in there and there'll be some changes in the space as we move ever closer to the installation of new exhibits up at Chapin Mason Museum. So I would say, uh, and this is a question really for Christy Shawley, our Chief of Interpretation. She has set a tentative date of June or July for the opening of the museum, but it's dependent upon the completion of these new rounds. Okay, thank you. And also um, just mentioning the ramps, that's something that the foundation did an initiative with. Shannon Clifford um, was got this fabulous grant through the Christopher Reeve Foundation to provide the accessibility to the museum. So thank you for mentioning that, Tara. Another question from Teresa, are the artifacts kept in climate controlled areas? Correct. So in addition to the climate controlled archive, we have a collections repository that has, that is climate controlled. The Visitor and Research Center, and I didn't go into it in, in any depth at all, the new Visitor and Research Center down at the park entrance is state of the art. It received LEED Platinum certification and it has a very stable uh, environment and uh, security and fire protection 
So it's uh, just an all, it's an, you just couldn't ask for a better space uh, to house a museum collection. And it is meeting all the standards that we hope to meet as museum professionals. So I'm, I just can't say enough about how privileged I am to work in, in such a facility. Great, and uh, this is a question from Chris. Who does the actual processing of the records? Right, well, as you know, I'm a recovering historian. <laughs> <laughs> Better than so, recovering other things. <laughs> no, it's just a way to, to help me understand that historians have a different, we do, we have a slightly different brain than archivists and, uh, and I've learned so much, but um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Um, um, who does the actual processing oh. of the records? Well, you've asked a wonderful question. I could really speak endlessly about this, but in order to be cost effective and to uh, get through the amount of material that we've had to get through, we've uh, oftentimes worked cooperatively with the University of Arizona's School of Information Management, and we have archivists working alongside students who are training to be archivists, and they have done some of the processing work and probably will be with the Cultural Resource Record Group. Wonderful. And, and I can do some, you know, but um, not on such a high level, not on a gross level like this, no. There's uh, only so much time and resources one person has. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even though you're capable of it. No. <laughs> um, here's another question from Teresa. So Teresa, thank you for all your interest today. Um, this is actually going back to Chris's question about the actual processing of the records. Teresa would like to know, is that a volunteer opportunity? Yes. So actually, uh, well, an archivist record group, once it is processed, it's only processed until the next month when we have accretions, right? So the work of the Park Service isn't stopping. So although we have a natural resource record group that's been processed, we have records that have subsequently come in and they're called accretions and we have to, and we want to integrate them into the already processed archives to make them available. So there are definitely volunteer opportunities. Um, I had a CU Boulder intern who went through all of the uh, per research permit and collection permits for the for Mesa Verde National Park and she was looking to make sure that all the permits had been intellectually associated with the collections and that was intern project that I'm holding in front of me right now. Okay wonderful and this is um, a question from one of our Mesa Verde Foundation fellows Doug Bacon. Are there pictures of each physical item in the Mesa Verde collection, such as a sandal that has been found? And are those images archived in the same fashion as you have described? Or is that part of your goal? That is part of our goal. So managing this archival problem or issue that, that was part of the experience of learning more about the overall museum collection at Mesa Verde. Uh, we had many photos taken of museum objects in the past, but they didn't oftentimes have the metadata. They didn't have the associated accession number or catalog number, and it was hit and miss. There wasn't any sort of organization in how those photographs were taken. So they were taken, you know, somebody needed a photograph of a sandal. So they took a photograph of a sandal. So now what we're trying to do is to create a photographic archive, if you will, of digital images of the museum objects, cultural items, so that they can be made available for all of our social media and all the many myriad ways that we would use these images. And so, uh, right now, Spencer Burke and I are, we've set up a space, we're working on it, and every time we take a photograph of a museum object for any reason, we're now, you know, making sure that it goes into this uh, new archival collection with the associated metadata. Mm -hmm. 
Wonderful. It's amazing, Tara, what you're doing and what you've done in your career. I was like, I had such curator envy when you were talking about your work at Canyon de Shea. <laughs> I think we all had a little bit like, oh man, that sounded amazing. I have um, a question for the archives. Who can have access and um, to the archives for like study, for scholarly reasons? And what's that process like? Oh, thank you so much for asking that question. So we have a researcher registration form. So just send me an email, call me, um, and we will send you a form that you fill out that just states your name and what your research interest is and, and what you're hoping we have or some idea of what you're looking for. And then we will generally send you a finding aid from one of our process collections that you can go through. And the wonder of a finding aid is it's a, it's a searchable PDF. So you can search on various search terms related to your research. And then if you find that we have records that would help you in your research, you're welcome to make an appointment to come in and to actually work with the archive and to work with the original records, which is part of our goal. And it's it's important that we provide accessibility. Mm -hmm. uh, during COVID, when we were not able to welcome the public into the Visitor and Research Center, uh, my associate uh, museum technician, Sam Denman, and I, we would scan documents and send them to researchers because they couldn't physically come to the archive. Wow. We are open now, so I'm very excited to welcome you into our archive. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And I have um, a personal question. I know with different institutions and their archival departments, they have outside partnerships or affiliations with universities or colleges. Does Mesa Verde um, Museum have any affiliations? I, I wouldn't say they're... they're no, we have, we're working on memorandum of agreements for certain external repositories that house Mesa Verde collections. So um, that's something that we're working towards. We do have, outs we do loan a great deal of our museum collection to other re external repositories for especially natural resources. We've had a lot of work done with our natural resources. CU Boulder has come and done quite a bit of work. And some of those collections that were um, part of CU Boulder research projects are housed at CU Boulder and they're under loan from Mesa Verde National Park. And we may, you know, it, it might make sense in the future. And I'm not saying this is CU Boulder, but you know, that's an example, mm -hmm. the type of memorandum of agreement that could happen in the future. Uh, for the care and maintenance of that particular collection. Well, well, thank you, Tara. I'm just going to leave the, the chat box open for another minute. So if anyone has um, any questions, we're just getting some lovely feedback about your presentation, Tara. Um, if there's any questions, please leave one now. And while we're... Uh, in the few moments that are left, I'll show you some fun things that are CCC Archival Record Group. Uh, the CCC folks at Mesa Verde at the various camps produced something called Mesa Verde Notes. And in those notes, you have different kinds of drawings and poetry. This is a uh, research project called Mesa Verde Coiled Basketry by Robert Kirg. And he looked at the remains of coiled basketry in the museum collection and wrote it up. And you can see that there's some very excellent drawings of the type of weavings that he found associated with those. We also have some CCC photographs. This is of a piece of furniture that was built by some of the participants from the camps. And on the back of that photo, it says the remodeled bookcase in the Park Naturalist office from November 23rd, 1936. And underneath it is a scene at the gravel pit showing the pressure from June, 1935. So quite different types of activities going on with the CCC. 
And this is from one of the CC notebooks. So these are the original order of these photographs as they came into the archive. Well, wonderful, Tara. It, it's unbelievable. It seems like we need to do a part two just for the archives. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> And as ever, thank you so much for giving us your time, your expertise, and just your enthusiasm. Shannon, do you have any last words? I would just say congratulations. That was big news. Thanks for sharing yes. it with us. And also thank you for being here, of course, both of you. Fabulous ladies on Women's Day. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, that's everything. Then Bye. we'll we'll say goodbye. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>